Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. Welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gell, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Did you know that about 20% of learning problems are related to vision disorders? And 80% of learning is through vision. Today's guests, Dr. Brian Dornbos and Dr. Tuan Tran are experts in vision and learning and the treatment to help children who have vision-related learning problems. Dr. Tran is the co-founder and chief medical officer a vivid vision, and Dr. Brian Dornbos uh, did a did a vision uh, did a VA residency. Guys, I want to welcome you to the program and thank you for being with me. Great, thanks for having us, Gary. Really appreciate it. Well, let's get right into it. So, tell me, what is vision training, vision therapy? So, Tuan, I'll leave this one for you. So, vision therapy encompasses many components within optometry when it comes to how the eyes work together and how the brain processes vision. So as optometrists, we look at the development of children and particularly what pertains to the two eye teaming together. Um, and we look at ways in during development of, you know, if a child miss a, a milestone where it might affect the learning process. So how many studies are there out there that show that uh, poor, eye teaming or the eyes working together can actually affect learning? So there's quite a few studies that are out there. The difficulty we see with vision training and with vision and learning is that a lot of these are small in nature. So they're not going to meet the criteria of a double blind placebo controlled type clinical trial. You may find more case studies, case series, case reports, uh, so smaller type reports, but we also have some larger studies that have come out of the Pediatric Eye Disease Investigator Group. So you've got the Convergence and Sufficiency Treatment Trial and a lot of work that has been done specifically revolving around convergence and sufficiency and learning and eye teaming, et cetera. When I see kids that are, really hate to read and they lose their plays, they skip, they misread, they have terrible comprehension, Many times they have what you said, they have convergence and sufficiency. Can you explain what convergence and sufficiency is and how common is it? Most certainly. It's actually really common. Around 10% or more percent of the population have convergence and sufficiency. When we think of convergence and sufficiency, we have two critical eye movements. We have convergence, bringing the eyes in together to focus on a point, say when reading, and divergence, the eyes going out and relaxing to look away. Convergence and sufficiency is the difficulty or inability to maintain converged eye position. And what can roll into this is not just the ability to maintain convergence, but also very similar disorders, like the inability to focus or in the, in the visual world, we call that accommodation. So focus on a page, converge, keep the eyes turned in together. And then on top of that, we have the necessary movements of tracking. So maintain a converged eye position focus and then track along as we're reading. You know, you see these kids, and I know as practicing optometry for close to 30 years, that come in with these learning problems and they've been from doctor to doctor to doctor and nobody has picked it up. And sometimes it's very common as convergence and sufficiency. Like you said, it's about in 10% of the population. What are some of the tests that eye doctors could use to diagnose convergence and sufficiency? So there, there's quite a few tests that's easily done within an optometric exam room. Uh, one of the ones that we all do is called a cover test. And what that does is it covers one eye and the other eye. And it allows us to see the posture of the eyes at far away and up close. And if we determine that the patient has a posture that sits more outward than pointed directly at the target, that's an indication of the, that they might have some convergence issues. Another one that we commonly do is called the near point of convergence, also called NPC. And what that's a measurement of is how far 
or how close the patient can fixate on a target and bring it up to their nose without losing eye posture. Many times what we do is that we repeat the near point conversions test several times. And about the second or third time if they, if they do have conversions difficulty, their eyes will start to converge toward the target and then won't be able to fixate and then go back outward. So those are two really easy tasks to measure and to indicate if they do have conversions problems. What can a parent do at home to see if their child may have convergence problems? Anything simple that they could do at home to, and, and perform it up with their child. And if it's abnormal, then they could come to the eye doctor and get it tested by a professional. Sure. I think the, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Russ. First and foremost, I, it, just a simple question is, does the child enjoy reading or enjoy schoolwork? Uh, is, the, is the child complaining of headaches or blurry vision or uh, words moving around on a page? So just a question to the child, uh, or if a parent's noticed that the child does not enjoy reading particularly. The second thing is, as Tuan described, a very simple test is the near point of convergence, asking the child to track all the way in to their nose. Kids should have really good ability to maintain a converged eye position and be able to move their eyes all the way in, all the way up to their nose. If when watching the child's eyes, they start to go outward, diverge, like Tuan had said, that's a very simple potential uh, sign that can tell a parent that perhaps this child is struggling and it's time to get the opinion of an optometrist. Now is Reading the, the chart at, from the nurse, is that enough to tell if somebody has a, a vision problem? Unfortunately, it doesn't. <laughs> a, a lot of times when we see patients with binocular vision dysfunction, um, conversion insufficiency falls within it. They often see 20-20 in each eye, but when it comes down to eye teaming, that test is not a really good metric to measure that. Now, with, with focusing and, and focusing problems, talk about that. How does that affect learning? So a little different. Uh, again, as I said before, there are a number of components that happen when specifically reading. Is the eyes not just need to maintain a converged position, but also need to maintain a focal point on something up close, be it a textbook, picture, and then also be able to look far away. There's an adjustment of the focal system of the eye called the accommodative system to adjust distance to near back and forth. And it should be a very rapid fluid movement and allow the eyes to converge and diverge together. When the accommodative or the focusing system does not work, we'll see the biggest complaint of blur. Things just don't look clear. The accommodative system could be underactive. It's not uh, able to focus up close. The, accommodate, the accommodative system can also be overactive. It can spasm and cause the eyes to maintain a converged position. And this is not one that's really easy to see. This is not one that you're going to look at a patient and say, yes, this is definitely an accommodative disorder. There's a few tests that are done to check how quickly a patient can focus, far to near, far to near, back and forth, and how quickly a patient, or how long a patient can maintain a converged eye position. What's the history of eye therapy? If you can look, if you look back over the last hundred years or so, uh, give us kind of a perspective on it. You really have to look back to ophthalmology and specifically a French ophthalmologist by the name of Javal. Uh, this all came about, uh, this idea of vision training came up from the medical community. And it started to take this divergence between as optometry became, more relevant, and this secondary path of orthoptics. Orthoptics tended to focus more on eye movements, so the ability to move the eyes in, out, up, down, converge, diverge, whereas optometry built this road of vision therapy, which, yes, takes the concepts of orthoptics, being able to converge, diverge, and move the eyes together, but now added in eye teaming, the accommodative or focusing system, vision and learning type, techniques and built up this realm that we call now vision therapy. Give me the categories of patients that could be helped with vision therapy. Oh, there's, there's quite a lot. 
Uh, as, are you asking as far as like um, particular disorders? Disorders. Sure. So this is for anyone who has lazy eye, um, what we call that as strabismus. Uh, I'm sorry, amblyopia. It's also cross eyes, which we call strabismus, where the eye can turn inward or outward. There's the convergence or versions disorder that Brian talked about previously, focusing issues as well. And usually what, what we see is not just one of these issues within the patient, but we see many of them. Many of the times, if they have convergence insufficiency, they also have poor eye tracking and accommodative or focusing issues too. When we talk about strabismus, where the eye, one eye is turned out or it alternates an eye turned out or an eye turned turn in, can vision training help that or vision therapy, or do those people have to have surgery? Very much so. I really, the thought is if an eye is out, the first thing that I think a lot of patients think of is, well, if we just cut the eye muscle and make the eye straight, then it should work just fine. And the issue actually is not muscular in nature, far, far more often than not. The issue actually is the inability to use and team both eyes together. So vision therapy can help with strabismus, be it an inward turned and outward turned eye, essentially working and helping teach the patient how to use both eyes together and develop true binocularity. What's interesting is even patients that do have a surgery, oftentimes the eye can move back out or in after the eyes were set to straight. And the problem is the patient never really learned how to use both eyes together normally. After strabismus surgery, if they do have surgery, does vision training still help them? Is that still something that they should consider? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of times when they get strabismus surgery and the eyes appear straight, what the vision training would do is help the brain to connect the two eyes together, to train it to turn not only the left eye, but also the right eye, and to hopefully get them to see in stereo, which is 3D vision. Now the ultimate goal of, in my opinion, of getting these surgeries or to get vision training for strabismus is to get stereopsis, what we also call 3D vision. 3D vision is what we consider that glues the two eyes together. And once you develop the 3D vision, there's really no reason for the eyes to not seeing 3D anymore, and so it won't turn out as much. So the goal is we want to get depth perception if we can. Yes. So which would you say 3D vision? Uh, I'm very interested in sports and sports vision. There's a big part of optometry where people do sports vision to enhance people's uh, ability to play sports through vision. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, sport vision, sports vision specifically is really interesting. Is and there's two thoughts on this. It the one side is taking an athlete that is already really high caliber and making the athlete better. The other side of that is taking an athlete that has some deficiency and improving the deficiency so that vision works together. And that's two sides of sports vision. Absolutely, what sports vision can do is look for these underlying binocular vision disorders. Something some times something as simple as convergence insufficiency. The other side of that is improving the patient's ability to team and use both eyes together. Uh, what also sports vision will do is challenge the athlete, is it may work on changing an athlete's visual perception during these activities to work on their ability to work on visual space to the left, to the right. Think of what an athlete is required to do when they're say playing baseball they need to be aware of the entire field but they may be focused more on what's going on to the left of them if they're out in left field I, the other side is again helping those athletes that struggle and what you'll find often when looking and working with these high caliber athletes is they found compensatory mechanisms they found a way that despite a visual deficiency They've been able to excel. And now this helps the athlete go to the next level by finding that deficiency, correcting it, and allowing them to use their own skills to improve. Yeah, people don't look at uh, improving their eyes as much through sports, although this is a part of optometry. I had Larry Lampert 
Dr. Larry Lampert on the show and, and I interviewed him about vision therapy. And it's really just fascinating how they could improve the athletes. And I know a lot of major league baseball players have gone through vision therapy, especially when they're in the minor leagues. Sometimes when they're in the major leagues and they're on a hot streak, they don't like to pull <laughs> around with them. But when they're, when, they're in the, when they're in the minor leagues, they're doing everything they could get to get an advantage. advantage. Talk to me about perceptual motor training or perceptual motor issues and how what we do is that different than what an occupational therapist would do okay. so when, when it comes to uh, an optometrist working on he said upper uh, motor how we do it differently is that we we take vision into account is that we're able to put these athletes into scenarios that they wouldn't otherwise experience on the playing field. So for instance, we will, we will have activities where the target will be flashing for just a split second. The patient would have to be able to localize the target, process it, and then interact with the target within a split second. We're also able to work on activities where it's working their binocular vision a lot more. So stressing the convergence and the divergence and seeing if they can go from far to near as quickly as they can. A lot of these tests can't be done um, outside of a pantry. Now, there is a little bit of overlap, it seems at times, between an, what an occupational therapist may do and what a vision therapist or a vision therapy optometrist may do. And that's sometimes good and sometimes can lead to some confusion amongst patients that may be getting some type of visual activities from their occupational therapist, but are also getting similar activities from their optometrist. So there is some co-working in the field for sure, but ideally vision therapy is provided by an optometrist. My daughter is an occupational therapist in mm -hmm. Manhattan and they refer a lot of patients to optometrists who do vision therapy. Let's review some of the symptoms and some of the issues. So again, let's talk about uh, eye teaming. If somebody has an eye teaming uh, issue where their eyes aren't working together, what would some of the symptoms be? So a, lot, a lot of times these are children who are have experienced these difficulties and it's, it's hard for them to verbalize exactly what's going on. So you're not gonna typically hear I see double vision or things are blurry. What, what a lot of times you see is more physical um, signs from these patients. So if they have convergence problems, they might close one eye or turn the head to the side to use one eye and just looking at a page. You might, um, you might see them start to squint their eyes and strain. You see the forehead start to scrunch up a lot more. Sometimes you see the, the child holding a book and because the convergence at near is it, a lot higher when the target is close to your face, they might start pulling things further back or they might prefer doing things at computer distance. Many of these kids get tired after reading for you know 30 minutes because their binocular vision is so stressed out. And so they were com complaining about being sleepy or they might get headaches so typically you won't hear vision related problems, but you'll see it and you'll hear complaints that their body doesn't feel as well. Uh, Brian, what other uh, signs may a parent observe for a child that is having trouble, vision related reading problems? What, can, what else can they see? I think again, definitely Twan's point of having a headache uh, is one. Covering one eye or avoidance is one of the really big ones. You'll see that it's not enjoyable. I don't want to do any of this. I don't want to do my homework. I don't want to read. Uh, that's one of the big ones that we'll see in the office is my child doesn't like to read at all. And when you do an exam, you find out that sure, the reason the child doesn't enjoy reading is eye teaming is very, very poor. You'll see complaints of double vision more in adults that can really verbalize what the complaint is that they distinctly see double. Uh, that's again going to be more of an older patient that describes this or a patient that has a true disorder that's caused double vision later in life. 
What the visual system is actually really good at doing is compensating. For patients that have poor eye tracking, poor eye movements, or an eye turn, the visual system essentially starts to ignore bad input. If the eyes go double, the visual system starts to ignore that image for a child. So a child may not, that's why they're not saying, I, I see double, I see two. Uh, that's really what makes it a little bit tricky for a parent to tease out what may be the problem for their child. Tawan, how about reversals? Parents always, they used to use the word dyslexia of kid reverse letters. At what age is that appropriate and, and normal? And when should that disappear? And when should, is that really a problem? You actually see it uh, often before they even know their words or, or letters. What, what we typically would notice is that they, they wouldn't know the left and right hands well. There, a lot of times we do the, the L with their hands. And then we start to notice that the child is consistently doing this. They aren't really aware of where they are in space. What, what we think of a lot of reversals is that the patient or the child doesn't understand their body um, as respect to the entire word is where's my hand in relative everyone else or everything else? Where am I standing relative to the computer? Am I to the left of it? Where space is? And so when we work on lateral reversal, what we try to do first is have the child be aware of laterality, which is the direction based on themselves and the direction. So left, right, north, south, east, and west. And then we go more into the letters. DD, PQs, those kind of reversals. Brian, how about when a kid is is doing this? He's he's doing his reading or his writing and his head's tilted and he's really close. Parents are very concerned about that. We get many patients that come in and they talk and they tell me that their child does that. What does that mean? Uh, that can be a number of issues. It could be poor handwriting skills, for one. They, the pencil grip, the ability to actually work uh, and use fine motor skills to write is an issue. And that may be more of an occupational therapy type problem. The other side of that is it could be a visual problem, is the child has found a comfortable way to function without actually being able to stress their visual system versus sitting in a nice, normal posture, using normal handwriting. They've built their own type of compensation, which is this scrunched up kind of contorted method, which gets them by, but doesn't really allow them to succeed when materials become much more difficult. I'd like to ask you both this question about self-esteem. Kids that have these problems, a lot of times have very poor self-esteem. They don't like to learn. They don't like to go to school. They won't read. You know, they won't answer questions. Uh, they won't read out loud. I'll make a comment about self-esteem and vision-related problems. Well, absolutely. You kind of let us down the rabbit trail, so to speak, with this. <laughs> is Self-esteem is, is really an issue, and this comes in a number of different ways. It can be, to a degree, masks, where a patient has normal eye posture and functionally looks normal, but struggles in school to succeed. And they see their classmates being able to read, being able to do well in school, where they're constantly struggling or working three, four times as hard as their friends. The other side of that is those that have a visible eye disorder, an eye that's turned out or in, where someone can noticeably say, wow, what's wrong with your eye? Uh, those patients also tend to have uh, self-esteem problems because they don't feel or look normal because their eye is turned abnormally. Uh, it really has a big impact on the way that the patient, the child, the adult perceives themselves. Uh, Tawan? Yeah, and, and to add to that, Brian, uh, you know, growing up, I, I had conversions insufficiency. And I always felt that I had to work a lot harder than my other peers. Um, I didn't realize that my headaches were related to uh, my CI problem. And so I avoided a lot of reading tasks. Um, I didn't feel comfortable with it. I avoided a lot of sports because I, I believe it was because of my poor convergence ability. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of self-esteem issues that can arise from these kind of disorders. Uh, before we get in, before we get into treatment, is there any other uh, 
signs or symptoms of learning problems that we could help with eye exercises, vision therapy? So there, there are skills that you can work on uh, when it comes to understanding things like laterality and visual processing. When you have to work on more of these disorders that has to do with convergence, amblyopia, lazy eye, cross eye, uh, it really should be done with supervision of an eye care professional. And there are exercises that they, that they can help and guide you on how to do it. Yeah, I think uh, to that note, there are some really simple uh, perceptual games and activities that can be done uh, by a parent and child pair. Uh, simple things like word searches, uh, some perceptual games, uh, matching games, card games like uh, Go Fish or so. Those are really simple ones to start off to help a child and parent work together to build up at least the visual perceptual side. And again, then for the more advanced disorders, engage an optometrist. Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. Okay, let's talk about treatment now. Uh, Brian, if you could start about the traditional ways that optometrists and ophthalmologists have used to for a vision therapy? Yeah, I'll set this up as going back to my statement from earlier is there's kind of two branches that have come in. Ophthalmology tends to focus on eye movements alone and ophthalmology now tends to work with orthoptists, uh, trainers that really work on the ability of the eyes to converge, diverge and move together. And the second thought of that for ophthalmology is being surgically minded. If there's an eye that's deviated, easy way is to cut the muscles, rearrange the muscles, and then fix the eyes by placing them straight together. Whereas optometry and vision training has taken a different approach. This is more of the holistic type approach where patients can improve their vision by working on convergence, divergence, eye teaming, and all around the, the concept of using both eyes together. And what vision therapy is performed today is technology. So looking back at how vision therapy was done is that we will work on various visual skills with the patient. So we, we, must, we, we usually start off by doing ocular motor. So training the patient to be able to fixate their eyes and move it properly, left eye, right eye, and then both together. Then we work on skills that require binocular vision. So like Brian said before, we would train the focusing system, the convergence system, and also the depth perception. If they have some type of cross eye or lazy eye, we we'll incorporate anti-suppression technique, which is just a method of training the two eyes to turn on at the same time. The current way of doing vision therapy just incorporates computer orthoptics, computer software, virtual reality into the mix to have the, the patient experience things that they wouldn't be able to do with traditional tools. So talk about some of the old fashioned ways of doing it, the Brock string and the Vectogram. How are those used in vision therapy? And what are they? So the Brock string can be used in, in different ways for different visual skills. Typically what the Brock string is used for is to work on convergence difficulties. It's a string with, it could be anywhere between one, and five beads on it. The patient would hold the string up to the nose and the other end of the string would be on a hook or a door. And there will be beads on different parts of that string. What the patient is asked to do is to fixate on a bead, make sure that their eyes are pointing at it. And when it is, they will move to the next bead, to the next bead and tell us all the way up to the nose and they can converge there. The vectors, those are ways to work on convergence as well as anti-suppression techniques too for lazy and, and cross eyes. 
what those are, it can be either using red green glasses or polarized glasses. But this film have different display properties on each of them, where depending on the glasses that they're wearing, they will see different part of that film. And by sliding the film, we can work on convergence or changing the film, we can work on suppression techniques. So let's talk about what you developed, uh, the virtual rea reality. How did you get the idea to, to combine uh, vision therapy into virtual reality? And Tawana, I assume you're the one that, that invented yeah. it? So here's a guy that had convergence and sufficiency, maybe had a few learning problems and some, some sports problems because of your own eye disorder. And you in, invented this new way of doing eye exercises that are fun using virtual, virtual reality that children love. So are you a big gamer? Why did you develop this? I, I was a big gamer, but I was inspired by the patients that I was working with. One of the difficulties that we had was keeping patients engaged in the task and then also challenging them while we were doing the treatment. Many of, of your patients who's doing vision therapy are young children and they're used to having phones and games and tablets. And when you show them a static image and ask them to look at it for a few minutes, they easily get bored. And our experience is that if engagement is poor, the therapy is not going to progress as efficiently as possible. And so around 2012, what started occurring was the VR has that became available or in beta testing to consumers. And I thought, what if we start to gamify this? What if we took concepts from vision therapy, incorporate it into fun, interactive games that's not just using static images, and the patient wouldn't even realize that they're doing vision therapy while playing video games. And that's kind of how we got started. So we're taking kids with learning problems that are related to the eye and we're making it fun. Uh, Brian, explain a little bit more about that. So this is actually, there's a scientific component to this also. At its core, rehabilitation, specifically vision rehabilitation, is this concept called perceptual learning. And if we take learning, just break it down, what is learning? Learning is repeating a task again and again until you get better and better and better at it. So perceptual learning is focused more on the rehabilitative, you've had a skill and you lost it, or the habilitative, you're learning a new skill. Both of those concepts together. And this is common to physical therapy, occupational therapy, vision therapy. Now specific to vision therapy, it's now teaching a patient by repeating a skill again and again and again that becomes slightly harder each time until they develop the neural connections, the brain connections to learn how to repeat that skill very, very easily. And for us, for what we're doing in vision therapy as a whole, it's eye teaming, it's changing focusing back and forth, it's forcing the eyes to converge and diverge very rapidly. That's the skill set that we're really working and teaching a patient how to perform. And when you gamify this and you make that skill something really fun and have a challenge and a goal to it, now repeating that skill again and again forces the patient or the game player in this case to actively participate in what they're doing. So now I have a really big goal. Instead of looking at a series of beads on a string and converging my eyes and diverging my eyes, now I'm playing table tennis. And my goal is to break some bricks while I'm playing this or pop bubbles or what have you. And there's now a score component that's, uh, that's built into this. So you get this whole perceptual learning concept and you add motivation to it. And it's really easy to motivate someone when there's a score, when there's a game component to this, especially with kids. <laughs> so explain the difference between VR, MR, XR, AR. What's all the difference and why did becomes, you VR? It really becomes kind of an alphabet soup when you look at this. I, to think of this, for those that have not had experience with this, virtual reality or VR is a completely computer generated image. So I'm in a video game and everything that I see is generated by the computer. If we go to the next subset, which is mixed reality, now we've got a little more of the real world that plays a role in this. On the far end of that spectrum is 
AR or augmented reality, where we have a whole bunch of the real world shown to us and we're placing a computerized image somewhere in the world. Uh, the easy example to that would be say the Snapchat pass through filters or the, a couple of years ago when the Pokemon Go game came out. Then there's this new term that has come out, which kind of is the, the catch all term of XR or extended reality, which puts them all together as, yeah, we're somewhere in this, this mix, but it can easily get confusing. The whole concept with any of these is the concept of immersion or presence so that you feel like this is part of your world. In VR, it's all in, in the computerized world. In augmented reality or in mixed reality, it's that the computerized component is part of your world. And it allows you to then engage the same way that you would if this was a real life experience. It makes the brain light up the same way. If you're in a computer generated world, does the occipital lobe, which is responsible for vision, does it respond the exact same way that it would if you were actually seeing an image floating in front of you versus on the screen that you're working with? Now, we are concerned about the safety to some extent because of the blue light. Now, there's a, all this big uh, information that blue light is the boogeyman. Do, is, it, is it safe or do we have to worry about the blue light here? And should we be using a blue light filter as well? You know, blue light can act as a comfort, it can, it can be uncomfortable for some patients, but a lot of the issues with blue light stem from other problems in the visual system. If you think of when you're even in a, a setup like this, you're looking at a computer screen for an extended period of time. What's happening? Our blink rate is decreasing, which can lead to symptoms of dry eye and fatigue. If you have a binocular vision disorder, like convergence insufficiency, that's going to cause some eye strain and fatigue. Blue light filters can help in some degree. It may, re it may increase the comfort for some people. It may also play a role in the way that the visual system responds to the sleep-wake cycle to a degree. But as far as the actual concern for a, a, a vision-related problem, the jury's pretty well out and says it's not really going to cause any problems as far as exposure to blue light. In fact, what's a little more concerning is going outside on a sunny day and not wearing sunglasses. Talk about virtual reality in healthcare, Tawan. Uh, it's not only used in just optometry, it's also used in other parts of healthcare. Yeah, so virtual reality is used in multiple disciplines of healthcare. Uh, we're seeing it be used in the educational settings where there's companies out there who are simulating surgery for surgeons and teaching these residents how to do surgery that's pretty darn close to the actual thing. Uh, I think Brian and I have tested quite a few, tried a few at Academy of Ophthalmology and they were very lifelike. So from, a training, from an education standpoint, that's been very exciting. We're seeing companies that are starting to incorporate or work on incorporating virtual reality into their equipment, such as for cataract surgery. Um, I remember seeing prototypes, uh, talking to companies where they are trying to make it so that instead of the doctor looking through a microscope, they're able to just wear a VR headset and do the surgery, and everyone else on the screen is able to see as well. We're seeing, yep, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, if you have uh, one of the vivid vision that you could show me, the virtual reality nearby that you could just show it to us, or well, Brian, do you have one handy? Yeah, I do. So this is an example VR headset. This is the Oculus Go headset, which is a portable wireless headset. It doesn't require a phone to be snapped in or anything. There are other headsets that will run off of a phone and then higher grade headsets that may be tethered into a computer. So let's talk about, we have this child who has a learning problem that's related to vision. Let's go through the different areas where we can help them with virtual reality, vision therapy. Let's start with eye teaming. How does it work with virtual reality? So it, the core idea with virtual reality is we're not reinventing the wheel at all on this. With eye teaming, the goal is for the patient to be able to quickly converge, diverge, and have flexibility to their ability to move their eyes in and out. 
for a patient that has a strabismus, an eye that's deviated inwards or outwards, what would be used is a series of what's called prismatic lenses to help compensate where a patient's eye is turned outwards, help the patient compensate, reduce the amount of prism, and then slowly help the patient bring their eyes together. We can do the exact same thing in virtual environments. We can take a ball exercise where the patient is to track a ball that's moving around in space. Watch the eye, the ball move from left to right, up, down, in, and out. We can also take prism, and we'll do this in a virtual prism setting where we adjust where the images are placed in space. If you have a patient that has an eye that's turned outward, we'd move the image outward. And then over time, reduce that amount of outward displacement of the images so that the patient is forced to constantly work on bringing the eyes together more and more and more while they're working in a three-dimension depth perception environment. So the instrument could help people with eyes that turn out. It could help kids that have tracking problems. And it can help kids with uh, convergence and sufficiency. Tell me about how it could help tracking. So we have multiple activities uh, in virtual reality where it engages the eye-hand coordination. What, one of the first steps that we do when we work on eye tracking is having the patient look at a target and then touch it so that way they know where to look at and where it's localized in space. One of the activity encompasses that. It shows a series of circles in 3D. It lights up one of the circles. The patient would have to locate it, fixate on it, and then touch it with their hand as quick, quickly as they can. That works as saccades, which is the jumping of eye movements. If you add a moving component to it, it can work on pursuits, which is um, tracking a, a moving object. Because in sports vision, I know predictive saccade is very important. Uh, and so it could help with that? Very much so. And the key is tying these items together. So taking tracking, but adding the next layer to it. So eye-hand coordination. Can we build on not just moving the eyes, but now the patient actually being able to localize an object or a target in space and interact with it? How long does it typically take for the therapy to work when they start using this? So that, that really ultimately depends on the patient. Uh, normally, if you have a patient who has conversions insufficiency, it's within three months of treatment. We're, we're talking about one day a week in the office, and then they would go home and do activities for about 20 to 30 minutes a day, five days a week for that three months. For a patient with amblyopia or lazy eye, many times it takes anywhere between three to six months. The same procedure, going to the office once a week with about five days of home activities. And for someone with cross-eye or strabismus, it can be anywhere between six months to 12 months, sometimes longer, depending on the severity. It is important to remember that these patients have had these dis disorders for many, many years. And so we're trying to overcome and teach them the proper way of doing things within a three month to 12 month period when they have been living it with this for 10 plus years. Let's talk about the convergence and sufficiency kid, the kid that can't cross his eyes very good and that loses their place, they skip, they misread, they read out loud, and they can't read a sentence without fumbling over it. After about three months, how much improvement, if, they, if, they're, doing, if they're doing it the way that's prescribed, how much improvement could we expect? I think that the key is what you said right there, is they need to be doing their exercises at home, and that's where the concept of perceptual learning comes into play. Let's assume Constantly, that. Right. Let's assume that. So, We'll see a lot of improvement. We'll see an improvement in the near point of convergence, the ability to maintain a converged eye position over time. The other component of this that's really important to remember is working the flexibility of the focusing system. So when we tie these two together, convergence exercise, not just convergence exercise of yes, playing a game where they're converging and diverging, but also working the flexibility and their ability to focus and change their focus from distance to near, we can see an absolute reduction in symptoms over the course of anywhere from eight to 12 weeks very, very easily. So we talked about some of the tests that doctors use to diagnose these problems, and now we're talking about the treatment and how long it takes for the treatment to uh, take place. 
I just want to ask one question. I'm a softball player. Can this help my softball game? <laughs> we can try our best for you, Gary. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I, I don't want them dropping me down in the lineup. <laughs> well, I want to thank you guys. You guys are, are, are really a wealth of information. Dr. Dornbos, uh, Dr. Trent, I, I, you guys are really terrific. If people want to find out more about you, they want to find out about your company, Vivid Vision, how can they go about doing that? Absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, we'd love to have anyone that's interested come visit us at cvividly.com, S-E-E-V-I-V-I-D-L-Y.com. And we'd be happy to give them some more information. And how can they find a doctor that prescribes your, uh, your technology? All of that is right on the cvividly.com website where you can locate a provider. We have over 350 unique clinics throughout multiple continents. Uh, we've now become a worldwide business, which is really exciting and have been able to help over 20,000 patients with our technology. Well, I just wanna thank you guys for developing this technology and helping me help my patients. It's been a great interview. This is Dr. Kerry Gelb for Open Your Eyes. Until next time. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kerry. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.